Okay, I'm Rabbi Moshe Perry. Uh, we're here for a tribute to Rav Binyamin Kahana on the seventh anniversary of the 17th Yortzeit for uh, this great uh, man, the son of Rabbi Rav Mer Kahana. And we're going to give a little drusha to start off with, a little Tavar Torah of his uh, talk, of his teachings, which will lead into a general discussion of things current in Eretz Yisrael right now on the political front in Eretz Yisrael with a few issues that are, that are currently happening. So Rav Benyamin was famous for being able to tie in Torah thoughts and Torah ideas with, with things going on in, in the political arena vis-a-vis -vis, uh, world events, uh, Israel's involvement, with its neighbors, unfortunate enemies, and he was able to tie in, especially the inner workings of the Israeli political system and government system and the army and all the issues of the day circulating and swirling around during his lifetime. Uh, he passed away. I was murdered Mark. in terrorism. Yeah, in uh, in 2000 uh, in uh, January. Was he assassinated? Yes, he was assassinated. In my opinion, he was assassinated. No different than his father was. Right. His father was um, uh, was killed uh, in 1990, November 5th. And Benjamin was, uh, you would think I would have the date ready to hand here, but um, we'll, we'll get it in a few minutes. Um, it was, it was uh, January of uh, 2000. Um, so, Benjamin was commenting on this essay that we're going to do right now. What he did was, he would take a idea and he'd make a newsletter out of it. Twice a month or so, he would send it out all over Eretz Yisrael, tens of thousands of copies, where he would, he would put his ideas down, what's going on, current events, plus, plus, he has selected concepts in the, what was called by his father, coined the phrase, the, authentic, the, the light of the authentic Jewish idea, where he would communicate the depth of the Torah in addressing these issues, whatever they may be. And here's an example of that in this presentation, in this essay that he wrote, that is in this collected writings book, that, which I'm sure aired in published, was first published in what was called his Darche Shel Torah. This, thus is the way of the Torah. And there was a newsletter that he sent out, a weekly Parsha sheet. I think it was bi, uh, bi monthly, uh, twice a month. And, and this is what he, he wrote this in 1995. And it, it's entitled, it was for the approaching Yom Atzmut, Independence Day. And he calls it the miracles of the Galut and the miracles of Geula, the miracles of the exile and miracles of the redemption. And he said, I'm just going to read some of this. A few months ago, this is his words, he's speaking. A few months ago, a flyer was distributed in the synagogues, which commemorated five full years since the miracles of the Gulf War, describing how this day is worthy for having us say Hallel and praise to God. This reminds us of how at the end of the same Gulf War, which ended in um, 1991, right before Purim actually, in February of 1991, at that time there were several communities who actually did say Hallel in and around uh, Eretz Yisro. All this, all this comes to mind as Yom Atzmut, Independence Day, comes uh, around again, approaches. Mm -hmm. For in so many of the circles who emphasize the miracles of the Gulf War, it was the first time in this generation that they praised God for saving us in a war situation. So is this not strange, he asks. Is it not strange that, that they've lived through 
1948 War of Independence. They've lived through the Six-Day War in 1967, and there's all sorts of controversies in the religious communities, Torah communities. Should you say hollow? Should you not say hollow? Were these miracles of Hashem? Were these not? And the bottom line is, people to this day in the Torah world don't know whether or do not say hollow on these days. And so he's saying, is there not miracles that happened in those wars greater? Certainly there were in the Gulf War miracles, but why are they saying, all of a sudden, they're saying, this is what we should do, this is, this is that we should say hollow and thank God. And on the other ones, every time it rolls around, Yom Atzmud or Yom Yerushalayim, they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily um, say hollow, or they say it without a bracha, or, or they say it not in davening, outside of davening, and therefore as a result, it, it, it's like left in the air. It's left up into the um, it's left up into the uh, ozone, whether or not Hallel is going to be uh, presented. Whether there's a real feeling that this was a salvation, a, a, a saving, a, a rescue from Hashem or not. And so I thought to myself, I said. Well, maybe this, these people weren't in Israel back in the 48 and 67. Maybe these people were just experienced that they went through this, whereas they weren't alive or didn't go, live through it. Either they weren't in Israel yet, they came from America later on, or they, they, were, they, they lived through it, but in their communities it was, it was, uh, it was not uh, emphasized. And as a result, I thought maybe that's the answer. They're just because they won't live through this, actually. So because they live through it, now all of a sudden they understand and appreciate it, that Hashem has done something great for them to save them, and they, and they want to say hello. But Benjamin takes a different trap. He takes a different uh, tact here, and he says that there's a difference between there's a difference between the ideas expressed in the Gulf War of what the Jewish people went through in the Gulf War and the aftermath and what the Jewish people went through in the, in the um, War of Independence and the Six-Day War. So he says the answer lies in the difficulty of so many to comprehend the new type of miracles that the 48 war and the 67 day war acclimated or activated for us in, 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 in Jewish history. The answer lies in the difficulty of so many to comprehend the new type of miracles which God has granted us in this era. They are miracles of redemption. What happened to us in 48 and 67. The miracles of the Gulf War on the other hand, were of the classic Galut style that we're used to, that is easy to comprehend. They were the miracles of the familiar sort that we got used to for 1900 years in the exile all over the world, where the Gentile tyrant decrees evil against the Jews, and the Jews sit passively, praying to God, who cancels the decree. And the story finishes less bad than expected. That's the typical way we've gone through the exile. The goyim rise up against us. We are helpless. We are helpless. We are defenseless. We pray to God. We fast. And Hashem always saved us. And sometimes people, unfortunately, lost their lives. But also sometimes, also sometimes, um, Sometimes they were miraculously all saved. But the general pattern was that the, na the nations of the world rose up against us. So we were helpless and hopeless and hapless. And Hashem came to our rescue. And so we're used to that kind of miracle for 1900 years. And the resulting factor is that so we know how to say hollow for these kind of miracles. We're used to that. However, however, this approach is probably what created, and we'll get to this in a, a little while, this approach is probably what created the opposition 
to a preemptive st strike in the in the in the Gulf War, whereas they thought about it, the Israeli government, and they decided to leave it to the coalition forces, to America, to fight this war for them. And as a result, we ended up with being attacked with Scud missiles. As a result, we ended up being forced in the aftermath of the, of the Gulf War into making a peace process that has been nothing but disaster for, for, for the Jewish people and for Eretz Yisrael. I call it being shoved into Madrid. And preempting, like they did in 67, led to a great Yeshua, a great redemption, a great salvation. And we got most of uh, Eretz Yisrael back as a result of that one uh, act. But preempting in the Gulf War, it, it, the mindset was, well, we should sit back. We don't want to anger Bush Sr., he's the president, making this coalition. His Arab partners are going to get mad at us, and, and it's going to ruin our relationship with America. So we, we, don't, want, we don't want to uh, do that, so we'll take a back seat. And that taking the back seat is transforming and transporting us to become back to feel like we're back in Gullis again. We're supposed to be in the beginning of the redemption since the state was founded in 1948, and all of a sudden now we're back with this Gullis mentality that, oy vey, what are we going to do, and that we need help, and, and God will come to our rescue, but maybe the Gentiles, some of them would be nice to us and save us. And that is, is, is the attitude that Benjamin would rail against and his father, obviously, Romero would rail against that we're showing a total lack of faith in God, total lack of trust in Hashem, and that has led to all the, the trouble and misery that we've seen since this Oslo process started, certainly. And that's what he says. He says, instead of having the attitude of going out proactively and standing up for ourselves with trust in God that we'll be successful, that Hashem will help us to defeat our enemies, we're going back to the way we were for 1900 years in the exile, where we're saying to God, well, we're helpless, we can't do anything for ourselves, our army's no good, we can't do anything, you've got to save us. And, and, and now it's not even God that we're looking toward, it's America. America's got to save us. And the great humiliation is that it sees Jews crawling around, he says, into their sealed rooms with gas masks. He calls it like, like, like where Jews cry and wait for a miracle, and in this case in the Gulf War, scurrying around into sealed rooms like a cockroach with a gas mask. Very harsh but very unfortunately true, we humili humiliated ourselves in this war as a mass, as a whole country, as a whole nation. We were supine to America and to the will of, of the coalition. And as a result, even though it turned out miraculous, nobody got hurt, all the Scud missiles were blanks and didn't hit anybody. And so it was a great Yeshua on that, but it was a Gullus type of redemption. It's a exile, it's a, it's, a, it's a miracle of God on the exile, exilic level of consciousness that we experienced for 1900 years. So the great miracles that took place for us in the first half of the century of the first 50 years of the state of Israel's existence belong, though, to a new and different category of miracles. A category which we had not known since the days of the Hashmonoim in the time of Hanukkah, the, the Maccabees. Those are miracles of redemption. Or they can be termed miracles of Kiddush Hashem. Not only does the bad decree against us get canceled by God, but as a result of the Gentile trying to wipe Israel off the map, the Jewish nation performs God's will, rises up to defend itself, and returns fire to the enemy. And the enemy of Hashem, uh, anyone who's an enemy of us is an enemy of Hashem, Judaism teaches, and we forge ahead. Not only do we self-defend and protect ourselves and preserve ourselves, but we attain sovereignty over more and more of our biblical heritage, our biblical homeland conquering huge swaths of the land of Israel in the Six-Day War, for example. 
and the Kiddush Hashem that's accompanying that goes with it to the astonishment of the entire world. And so that's an example. Hanukkah and the Six-Day War are examples in the 48 War to a lesser extent of miracles of the redemption on the way toward Geula, on the way toward our, ourselves not only getting out of the exile, but returning to our land, which if anybody knows the history, what the, the 47 UN uh, partition did was leave us a little sliver of land. It's always been fascinating to me. The world felt sorry for the Jewish people after the Holocaust. And even before the Holocaust, the world said, well, we've got to solve the problem of the Jews being pogromed and uh, in, 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 um, put, into, uh, put into situations of inquisitions and all sorts of things all throughout their history. So let's take their ancient land, which they knew back then in the 20s or after World War I. They knew it was the whole entire Mediterranean into Jordan, the other side of the Jordan River into the East Bank, all the way. They, they, they knew that was where the, the, the mandate for Palestine was. And in 1922, the British said, no, nah, we're going to give only this part. And we'll give this to the Arabs. And then a few years later, with a white paper in 1938, they said, no more immigration to Israel. The Arabs are mad. And then by 47, after the war, OK, we're going to split this land. We've already taken away this much. And now we're going to take away half more. So by the time we're finished, we accepted it. Ben-Gurion accepted it. The Arabs rejected and went to war. But we, we accepted it. And the end was, the end result was that we got a little sliver. Six million bodies. And they, the world could only come up with a little sliver of land that was indefensible. Abi Ibn said, <laughs> Abi Ibn said these are Auschwitz borders, lines. And as a result, and as a result, they're indefensible. But we said yes, and we went to war to protect them, and we got a little bit more. And then in 67, it really exploded, and we got a lot more. In fact, Ramer Kahana, uh, Benyamin's father, said, really, uh, Benyamin says it here also, really the war of, of Hanukkah was just to liberate Yerushalayim and the environs. And later on, in the hundred years that the Hashemunoyim ruled over Eretz Yisrael, okay, the second kingdom of Judea got a little bit further north and a little bit further west and east. But that was basically all that was liberated. And in the Six Day War, it was a much greater miracle. We got whole, whole chunks of the West Bank back of, the, of Yehuda and Shomron. And it's to the point where you could see the formation of getting back to where the, the Shvatim were, the tribes were at the time of the first base of Mikdash. They expanded so far. So that is a miracle of redemption. However, the Gulf War and the uh, other things that we've gone through in our history are miracles of the exile. And when you look at all the holidays, the ones that are in the Torah and Hanukkah and Purim, which are outside the Torah, which the rabbis along the way in history, uh, based on events in our history, signaled for us should be celebrated as holidays, they all were Miracles of redemption. They are all, they are all in the category where Hashem acts to save us, but we also acted in order to expand or to save ourselves. Now Pesach is a little hard because pa Passover is is a, a, a God doing the whole thing. Pesach in, in in the book of Shmos and Exodus, you see all the the plagues and the splitting of the Red Sea. It's all God. But on the other hand, there are things that the Jewish people do to show their trust in Hashem, which may not be of a militaristic mode or a militaristic uh, out outlay of their arms, but they at least took chances and risks. Like when they took a Korban Pesach, which was the lamb, was the god of, of Egypt, and they were willing to slaughter it in the face of the, all the Egyptians who were, 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 were outraged, and, and despite all the fear from the, from the plagues that God had brought upon them, they were ready to kill the Jewish people for doing this, this sacrilege and this, this, this blasphemy. And we, we, so it shows our great courage. 
at that moment and belief and trust in God. And as a result of that, that gives the nature of Pesach to be, obviously, because it was a redemption, a miracle of redemption. It wasn't a miracle of, of redemption from the, it was redeeming us from the exile, but it was redeeming us completely and taking us out to go completely free to go to our own land. It wasn't just the type of exile miracles that we were used to for the last 1900 years where we're still stuck in exile. And uh, this nation, uh, the, the Poles or wherever, Germans were wiping out Jews. And all of a sudden, we were, God stopped them and, and was able to, you know, through prayer and through things that the Jewish people were, were doing, tshuva. So Hashem stopped these decrees and made the uh, outcome not be as, as terrible or as horrible as it might have been. And so those were miracles and redempt, uh, redemptions of the exile. And so then he says that Hanukkah and Purim, while Purim, Hanukkah is clearly a miracle of, of redemption uh, because we went to war. We, we actually, the problem is, not many, uh, not many uh, Jews understand this, but w when we're looking at what was the miracle of Hanukkah, and you read from the al in the in the prayer book, right? It talks exclusively about the war. It, it, it doesn't even mention the miracle of the candle that, the, the oil that burned for one day turned into burning for eight days. And as a result of, of the, um, as a result of that miracle, that, that's where the, the, the significance is. That's where they put all of their kochos, all of their focus on in the eight days of, of, of celebrating Hanukkah is this great miracle of the oil. And nobody knows what to do with the miracle of, of the war. And in al that itself, the al that itself is the, the main focus here. It's only hinted at the end about the candles, about the oil, and lights burning in the, in the, in the courtyards of the base of Mikdash. So the, the, the focus is on the war, yet we don't celebrate that. On Purim, we don't even celebrate that. On Purim, we, uh, we, we, we also look at it, and it seems to be, Ben Yamin says, it seems to be, Purim is a typical, it happened in the Gullus, in, centered in Persia, in Shushan, and Ahasuerus uh, let Haman make this decree with him to wipe out all the Jews, and we did tshuva, and... Hashem stopped it from happening. So it seems to be that Purim is a, I can't read that, Purim is, the Purim is um, a Gullus redemption miracle, seems to be. But then Benjamin says, but if you look in the Megillah, you see very clearly that, that Ahasuerus says, no, I can't rescind my order. And once I give a decree, I cannot any longer take it back. That's one of the rules of our country here. That's one of our, our, our decrees that we've put in, our, our laws that we put on the books. So I can let you fight to defend yourselves, but I can't rescind it and tell people to stay home and not fight you uh, and not try and kill you. So by default... Purim became a miracle of redemption and not just a miracle of the exile because we were forced to fight to, to stop our enemies. Now, a lot of them didn't show up because they had already seen Haman get hung and, and they'd already seen the, the Mordechai become the prime minister. And as a result, but some of them did show up and some of them did try and fight and some of them showed up, to, Amalekites came to fight. And so we had to fight. But the, uh, the, the process by which the Jewish people in Purim became, a, that's why it became a holiday that Hashem, uh, the rabbis said, Hashem wants us to do this, to remember, commemorate it, is because it was a miracle of redemptive power. Soon after that, Achishverosh had stopped the rebuilding of the second base of Mikdash. Soon after that, after he died, his son, which was Esther's son with him, according to most uh, uh, commentators, uh, allowed the second temple to be resumed. And so the, what started with Purim ended up to be actually a redemption and the, and the coming back into, 
into our land and, and resettling it and going back for the Second Commonwealth, in, 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 which had been interrupted before, when Ahasuerus took the throne. Hanukkah, on the other hand, want to know and understand about Hanukkah. It also, obviously, is a miracle of the redemption. It happened in Eretz Yisrael, which is a place where, where, where we're supposed to be. And it happened in a manner where the Jewish people, obviously Hashem, it's a great miracle because we should have been wiped out in 30 seconds flat. We, you know, you can imagine Kohanim, who are not trained in war, for the most part, usually, a very few examples of a, a Kohen uh, coming out. There was one in David Melech's time, in King David's time, Ben Yada, and he, he, was, he, he gave up the chance to be the Kohen Gadol because he was like the third best or second best warrior that David Melech had, and so he stayed in, his, in the field. But usually a Kohen, a Pinchas, once in a great, great while, some, somebody who's a Kohen comes and can, uh, and is able to and can uh, show prowess on the battlefield. But usually they're in the Besamekdash, they're doing the Avodah, or the teaching Torah, uh, to the primary teachers of Klai Yisrael were the Kohanim and the Levim. The Levim more fought because they, were, they weren't as bound to the Besamekdash. But you can imagine these, Matis Yao was an old man, he was 120 years old or 80 years old, I, don't, I forgot what, how old he was at the time when he did the, the act of a revolution of, of killing the Jew who wanted to to put the pig on the Mizbeach, on an altar in his hometown to worship uh, Antiochus as the god of, of Israel, <coughs> God forbid. And so Matisio killed him and his sons weren't trained in war, but they started the revolution. So on paper, it's like, I always use the example of a professional football team playing a high school football team, not even a college team, which might have some chance, <laughs> a high school team. So what, did, what chance did they have? Obviously it's God, obviously it's a Shem, who came to their rescue and gave them this great victory out of nothing. They didn't have weapons, they didn't have training, they didn't have uh, strategy, they, they had nothing, military knowledge, nothing. And they, they, they just had the courage and the faith and the fight that they weren't going to put up with this anymore. Rav Meir and Benjamin, they talk about Hanukkah and they say, what is the great miracle of Hanukkah? And poor, of Hanukkah? It's that any Jews were left to stand up at all and willing to stand up. It's not that they, you have to choose between the war being a miracle and the oil being a miracle. The oil is a symbol, a simon, a sign for the miracle of the mysterious nefesh of the Jewish people that there were Jews left. There were great Jews up to that point that defied the Greeks for 50 years up to that point and the Hellenist Jews who were, who were torturing them and oppressing them, persecuting them. But they, wouldn't, they would hide away and do their mitzvahs, or they'd give their life up, they'd do bris mila and jump off a, a wall. None of them tried to fight the Greek uh, uh, garrison or the Greek army empire. So Hashem didn't make a miracle for them as great as the, the, some of these acts of bravery and courage and Messiah Snefers giving their life al Kiddush Hashem. None of them spurred Hashem to make this great Yeshua, this great salvation, to, to drive off the, the, the Greek Empire from oppressing us and, 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 and dominating over us. And so it took this action where these Jews were willing to say, we don't, we don't as long as the Greeks left us alone, when the, when the uh, Egyptian Greeks, the Ptolemy, King Ptolemy, held sway over us. So we weren't politically independent. We didn't care. They left us alone and let us practice our Judaism. But when the Syrian Greeks took over, they changed the whole tune and they started to decree things like against our keeping Shabbos or against our keeping the Rosh Chodesh or against us, us um, doing bris milah. And they started to impose their will. You couldn't read the Torah in the, on Shabbos in the synagogue. And you couldn't, uh, you couldn't teach Torah, right? So there were, there, were, there were Jews who defied these and hid away, right? They'd go door to door. That's where it comes from, this little minhag with the dreidel. It was a Greek, like a dice game or something, a gambling uh, object. And they'd go door to door and, and they'd be learning and they'd put away whatever scrolls they had and they would play and pretend they were being good Greeks. So they defied the Greeks, but they didn't do anything to signify that they were going to 
say to them that you've taken away our, our Judaism and we're going to openly defy you. We're going to openly uh, go against you even though it's suicide. That's, that's what they, it's like volunteering for a suicide mission. That's what they were doing. And that, Hashem blessed with the mysterious nefesh that they had, that Hashem gave them this great miracle and we know Hanukkah today for what it is. And so the oil is the little oil that could, the little cruise of oil that could. It symbolizes what the Jewish people were, that there were some people left who said, as long as we were left alone to keep our Torah, we were willing to keep our Torah. But as soon as they tried to dominate us and persecute us and oppress us and refuse to let us keep Torah, then that was too far. That's not worth living anymore. We're willing to die for this and we're going to try and push this off because we don't want to see Torah stamped out from the world. And the vast majority of the Jewish people at the time had caved out of fear and some out of, I guess, relief. They didn't have to keep mitzvahs anymore. The Greeks were going to liberate them. And so they were the Hellenist Jews that we know about. And they came and, and, they, and they participated with, they participated with the, the Greeks in, in holding a, a tyrannical, despotic rule over the Torah-loyal uh, Jews that remained, who had to go underground, who took the base of Mikdash away from us and defiled it, and did all sorts of manner of, 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 of you know, despicable acts there. And as a result, the, the Jews who were willing, as long as, even if they weren't politically independent, they were willing to put up with that. But the moment that it got to the point where Judaism itself was threatened with being wiped out of the world, they were willing to stand up, and that's the miracle. Ramera and Rabbi Yamin talk about it as the nes betocha nes, the miracle within the miracle of the Hanukkah story. That they, 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 they were willing to fight. They thought for sure. They had to know. They had to know they were going to lose. They didn't know going in. It's no great act of courage if you know God's going to be with you and make a miracle for you. Then you just have to, you still have to trust in God that his promise is good, right? <laughs> but that takes a certain level of courage. But if you know going in, you're going to be saved. Somebody's going to throw you into a fire and you're going to come out unscathed. You're willing to take the chance. I don't know how many of us, but maybe some. But if you think you're going to die, that's a whole new level. That's a whole new level of, of courage and, and, and fortitude and mysterious nefesh, self-sacrifice for God, for Hashem. And that's what Hanukkah is, and that's why it's a Hanukkah. It's a miracle of redemption. Anything where the Jew is beaten down, it's a Chil Hashem, and then Hashem gets tired of the Chil Hashem and saves for his namesake and to save a remnant of the Jewish people, like from... The Holocaust. So that's the ending the Chil Hashem. That's not necessarily making a Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Hashem is what Torah and Judaism is all about for us to be the nation of Hashem, the chosen nation of Hashem, to bring the Torah light to the world by our example and also to sanctify Hashem's name through our holiness and through being willing to be proud Jews and stand up for Torah Judaism. These are the kinds of things that Benjamin and Ramer Khanna talked about. And they got them in a lot of trouble in hot water because they were defying the norm of the whole entire government of Israel and the people of Israel who were wallowing and continue to wallow to this day. It's getting worse and worse in this gullus mentality. Remer says, you can take the Jew out of gullus, but you can't take the gullus out of the Jew. You, you, you come to Eretz Yisrael and you want there to be, you know, the Jew. He's, Remer said this all the time. You want it to be, they dreamed for hundreds and hundreds and a thousand years, we were going to one day go back to our land, and there we were going to have our freedom and our independence and our pride of being Hashem's people, and we're going to leave the exile with all the pogroms and all the inquisitions and the, and the, and the, and the expulsions and everything else, and we're going to come back to Eretz Yisrael, and we come back, from Pinsk and Minsk, where we were beaten because we were Jews, and now we come back and we've, we're back in Pinsk and Minsk. Back in sh shackles. Right, we're back in being not even able to defend ourselves because the government it seems to be on the side of the Arabs, because every time we would defend ourselves, they throw you in jail for defending yourself. 
It's absurd. It's, it's, so they stood up against this and said, we have to stop wallowing in the exile. We are supposed to trust in Hashem. He brought us back here. He made great miracles to keep us here and make it work that we wouldn't get destroyed. In 48, we should have been wiped out in five minutes. In 67, if we didn't preempt, we were supposed to be wiped out in, 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 in a couple of days. All of these are miracles. All these are nisim, galuim, open miracles. But it, what, didn't do, what it didn't do is wake us up internally to, to believe in God, to trust in God, and to be willing to stand for Hashem in the world. Look what Hashem did for us. Look what Hashem did for us. If only we now acknowledge it and thank Him. That's what Hanukkah and Purim are about. Praising God for these salvations. So the Yom HaTzmud and, 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 and Yom Yerushalayim should be no different. These are modern day Hanukkah and Purims. And we should be willing to stand up for it. And we should be willing to, to show that, you know what? We're not going to listen to anybody anymore. This is what Reb Benyamin and Reb Meir are talking about. They were taking the Torah and teaching these kind of mitos, these kind of character traits, to try and smash through the 2,000-year exile that we were crushed in and tell people that you have to, this is the Judaism, this is what Torah really is. This is what Torah Judaism really is, and this is what Hashem expects of us. We to find that summon the courage to stand up and defy the world. Instead, Reb Meir says, there's like an 11th commandment, thou shalt not provoke the goyim. That's, that's, he said that over and over again. This is, this is who we are. We are not allowed to make waves. Zash still. Right? Jew doesn't make waves. And that gets us into Holocaust after Holocaust, God forbid. Look at the situation in Eretz Israel. With impunity, Arabs are running around the place killing people. We can't even say Jerusalem is our capital <laughs> right. without somebody's, you know, and, and so they, getting into a bus. So Benjamin writes, so the, Benjamin writes in here, he says, listen, the, the, I used to get, he said, visited by special agents every day in the yeshiva at my home. I look at it as a badge of honor. They're not coming in to into the, the Mir Yeshiva or, 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 or uh, Panovich. Why aren't they going there to try? They're not threatened by the Torah that comes out of there, obviously. Because it's a Torah that is bowing to these Rishoyim that are running the place and is saying, okay, we'll just leave us alone. We'll isolate ourselves and cut ourselves off. You can take care of everything else, make all the decisions. And Rav Meir and Rav Benyamin's uh, Torah is saying, no, Judaism, God, Hashem, has a Torah here that's supposed to be implemented inside Eretz Yisroel. And the law says we're not allowed to have enemies here running around killing us. It's a Hashem. Hashem wants us to send them out. And we're not supposed to share the land and, make, and take God's name that's on this land that he liberated in 67 because according to our, according to our uh, viewpoint, we knew we were going to be wiped out in five minutes. And so obviously we didn't do this miracle of the Six-Day War. God did it. So his name is on these lands, and we're going to give them away so they can put Allah back on top of the, those names? Idolatry, a non-existent God will be, that's a Chil Hashem. And we're doing it with our own Yadim, we're doing it with the Jewish people, we're doing it with our own hands. That's the, the Avla, that's the sin. And so they killed them for this. They, that's why they killed them. Because they were threatening their Malchus, their power base. They were threatening their, 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 they were making in, Remer Kahana had 200,000 Jews ready to vote for him in 1988. He would have had 10, 11, 12 seats. Some people say 15 seats. In 1992, he would have had another 200,000. All the kids growing up wanted to vote for him. All the kids, 400, 500,000. He would have had 30, 40 seats. This is not true. What the lies they spread, he was nothing as extreme as a back, a racist. He's not a racist. Yeah. Why would the uh, secular Israeli government want to give up their power to God? Well, uh, that you answered your own question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is what we're up against. And convincing Jews in America, Torah Jews even, that this is right is like pulling teeth. I mean, I'm not a dentist, but I imagine it's pretty hard. <laughs> right? I, thank God I've never had a tooth pulled. Thank God. My just had four. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is Torah. And that's why it shook to the foundations. One man and his son after him, 
he was banned also. Koch was banned in 1988, and, and then Meir was, uh, was assassinated in 1990. And his son had made a Kahana Chai party, and he petitioned to run in the 1992 elections. They banned him too, they wouldn't let him run. And that's the year that the, the labor got in, and 93 was Oslo. So that's how crucial and important that election, those two elections would have been to stop Oslo from happening, which is not an Oslo peace process. Everybody who has, everybody who can think, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, if it's a death process. Yeah. I call Oslo the death to Israel process, God forbid, the roadmap back to Auschwitz, because that's what it is. Somebody put on Facebook uh, today or yesterday that, that Arafat was saying to his people, yeah, we're going to sign on the White House. We can't defeat Israel in war. We'll take whatever they give us and use that as a launching pad to get the rest. He said it openly. We just refuse to listen to it. People are walking around in denial and, oh, peace and love and brotherhood. It's all lies. And we swallow it because we, A, we want to believe it. We don't want to have to go to war all the time. And B, we're cowards. You have to say the Jewish people are a bunch of cowards all over the world because we're not willing to stand up. Rabbi Block said this about a terrorist event that took the life of one of our, our fellow students when he moved to Israel for 25 years. He was murdered in the, in the, in the Harnof uh, massacre of the four uh, rabbis uh, a couple years ago, three, four years ago. And, and, and Rabbi Block, a friend of ours, uh, he, he said the reason they're winning and they are winning is because we're not willing to do what they're willing to do for their cause, for our cause. We're not willing to go to the mat. They are. Whoever wants it more, it's true in sports, whoever wants it more will win. We don't want it. We're afraid. We don't want to have to go through this kind of, uh, you know, uh, self-sacrifice, uh, uh, Free, uh, you know, fright. Uh, it's very frightening to think about having to, to combat people who want to kill you. So yeah, here we can make peace. Someone said, someone once said to me, yeah, there's plenty of land, they can have some. It's a little Shem to talk like that. There's no pride. There's no, Shem gave this to Abraham Yitzhak Yaakov, you want to give it to filthy people who want to slit your throat and spill your blood? That's the, all they think about from morning to night? Wow. That's all they want to do. It's not about land. And this is Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov's legacy that God gave them. We're doing safer, gracious now. You see who we come from? That at the end of history, we have nothing left. We have nothing left to try and stand up for everything that Hashem wanted to do for us, what our Avos did for us. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Yeah. So they, they don't want it, to answer the question, they don't want us to be dependent on Hashem. They want us to be dependent on them. <laughs> or on America also. Right, right. They want to replace, it's, 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 it's idolatry. Yeah. They want man, they, they only understand, it's a cult of man that runs the world. You have to plug into the slime system or you don't belong, you're on the outs. It's the stuff that David Melech warned us about. Yeah, how, where? Well, in, the, in, in, in his Tehillim, in the chapter, I, I, okay. one specific one, yeah. don't rely on... on, on oh, oh, yeah, I'll tif tif the bin nevim, don't rely on princes. Right, Rabbi Mary and Rabbi Yami always talked about that. They said, here today, gone tomorrow. A human being, a flesh and blood? How can you put your trust in him? He may not wake up tomorrow. How do you know? You're, there's only one God. He's, he's, he's immortal. He's, he's, he's eternal. You can't see him or feel him or touch him. And it's very frightening to stand alone without knowing he's really there or not thinking or not being positive. But look at our history. Look at what we've gone through and see the hand of Hashem in history and work on yourselves. You have to learn Torah also. You can't just do it by thinking about it all the time. You've got to daven. You've got to do the mitzvahs of the Torah and you've got to learn Torah. And then you build up. It's like going to the gym. You build up your spiritual muscles so that you're able to stand when it gets hard, when the going gets hard, going gets uh, tough, the tough get going, right? That's a famous expression. Right? You've got to be able... To, 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 to take a leap of faith, a chance, that maybe Hashem will bail us out. If we show ourselves worthy, that we know, not only maybe, we know for sure Hashem will bail us out. Hanukkah, Purim, when we return to Hashem, there's no end of, we're His chosen people. He made a pact, He made a bris with Abraham Avinu, He made a covenant that He would always keep us around. We're immortal, we can, we're invincible, 
They can kill lots of Jews, unfortunately, throughout history. They can't destroy the Jewish people no matter what they do, what they try. Every generation, that's what we say in the Haggadah every year. They rise up in every generation to destroy us. But Hashem always saves us. Now, He doesn't always save us in a gullus redemption. He also wants to save us, especially nowadays, in back in Eretz Israel, He wants to save us in a Geula redemption, a redemption, a miracles of redemption, so that we get the final Gula Shlema here, and Mashiach comes. That is what Hashem's longing to do. But in order to do that, we got to deserve it. And the way we deserve it and can become worthy of it is by doing acts of, of faith and courage and trust in Hashem. That's what it's going to take of everybody. Uh, all the Jews, or at least a significant amount of Jews, like the Chashmonah, they weren't the majority of the Jewish, they weren't even the majority of the religious Jewish people left, the Torah Jews left. But they took this, this attitude that we know Hashem is there, we know He doesn't like this, and obviously He's had plenty of time through these persecutions to come to our rescue. He hasn't. So maybe He's waiting for us to make some gesture that we believe in Him first, and then He will give us, give us the uh, Yeshua, the salvation that we're looking for. And that's exactly what happened. That's what Hanukkah is. How many times does Hashem need to prove to us that He's there for us? Right. I mean, we have so many examples in our holy living Torah, you know. Um, and also Hanukkah and Purim outside of the Torah. Outside of the Torah. The whole Tanakh. And, and, and even recent events right. that show us time and time again these are miracles in front of our eyes. Yeah. I, I hope that we wake up to bring, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the ghoul of Mashiach. And, and, uh, Amen. Uh, so, the easy way, not the... Okay, but 10 more minutes. Okay, so I, I just want to um, point out one more thing. I was going to go into a whole, we can do it another time, where all of this relates and goes from talking about Judaism, Torah, mitzvahs, about how to appreciate the miracle of Hanukkah and Purim. All of this Reb Ben Yamin took and he translates it into how to deal with our current situation politically. And like there are people, remnants of the Kahana movement that are running for office in the future, uh, have and will in the future in parties. The question I have is, how are they, how are they not banned like they were banned? Rameer and Benyamin were both banned. Kach and Kahana Chai were both banned. So how is it that they're Kahanists and they're able to run? Obviously the answer is they're compromised. Mm -hmm. And the most important way they're compromised is they are not allowed publicly to stand up and say openly, without hinting, the Arabs have to go. They're enemies, the Torah says, you can't keep enemies on your land killing you, out they have to go. They, they're not accepting my sovereignty, Hashem says, out they have to go, you have to drive them out. Since they're, if they would say that, they end, not only would their party be banned, they'd end up in jail, or worse. So all of them, to a fault, to a man, will not do it now. And I've seen ample evidence of it in films that they've made, and evidence of their, of their, um, oh, one second, the evidence of their, of their, of their talks and of their political events, they won't say it. They'll even say, okay, you can stay, but you just got to behave yourselves to Arabs that are rioting or whatever. So they have caved. They have, right? So no Yeshua, Benjamin is famous for this. He says, the political system is broken. It disenfranchised my father in 200,000 votes. <clears throat> You're not allowed to openly talk about uh, things that the Torah says. You're not, it's like they didn't just ban my father. They didn't just ban his political party. They banned the Torah. They banned the Rambam. They banned the Judaism. Mm -hmm. exactly. And so the bottom line of that is, Yami said, therefore, the political system in Israel is 